Uh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Thank you all uh, for your very candid testimony. Um, <clears throat> I sort of feel as if this is a hearing on a document that I haven't seen. Um, and, and so I want to explore um, some of the inconsistencies between the interpretation of three of our witnesses and the words on the page. But, but first, I want to just start with you, uh, Mr. Barton. I want to thank you uh, for your advocacy in the face of unimaginable grief. And I want to Specifically, thank you for the holistic way in which Sandy Hook Promise has attacked this problem. We're sitting here talking about uh, the ways in which we can change uh, the enforcement of gun laws in order to prevent homicides. But your organization um, recognizes that the way in which we attack the issue of gun <laughs> violence is not simply through changing gun laws or better enforcement of gun laws, but also through increased efforts to uh, buttress mental health resources or to increase gun safety uh, mm -hmm. uh, or to prevent violence in the first place. You have a much broader agenda, don't you? Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, I hear words like attacked and this adversarial approach, and I, I think we should all be on the same page here. I think really, really we should be looking for solutions where we can agree that we need to move forward. Something has to be done. Um, and, and this this situation, the problem of, of gun-related tragedies is huge and broad and complex, and no one law will fix it all, no number of laws will fix it all, nothing will fix it all, but we have to approach it in a more, as you said, holistic way, Senator. But one of the reasons that you do focus on the issue of gun laws is because the research that you've looked at makes it pretty clear that states that make it harder for criminals to access guns have lower <laughs> rates of gun homicide, and in fact, a very recent report from Johns Hopkins uh, comparing Connecticut's law against Missouri's law and the effect of gun violence rates and gun homicide rates in those two states suggests that there is a real connection between uh, the laws on the books with respect to uh, the uh, easy access of guns to criminals and rates of gun homicide. Yes, that's correct, Senator. Um, there is clear evidence-based research conducted by Johns Hopkins um, that clearly indicates that the permit to purchase um, uh, regulation actually does, uh, has reduced homicides by 40%. It has reduced, reduced suicides by over 15%. And th uh, those, those numbers are reflected in the, in the inversion in states like Missouri that do not have this law where homicides have risen by 40% in the same time period. Suicides have gone up in, in 15%. And, and it comes down to, it, it comes down to access. And, uh, what we're talking about here is, is, is the whole fabric of this with regard to access, with regard to prevention. Uh, you mentioned my, my organization, Sandy Her Promise, is looking. Uh, we do a lot of work in the, in the space of prevention and finding these individuals who are on the path to violent behavior and getting them to the help that we need, that they need. And so there should be, we, we should be bolstering our mental health uh, system. We should have um, we should have a better, better legislation and, and mental health reform in place for a place to, to get these people to the help that they need. Um, so let me get at this inconsistent reading of the words and the guidance uh, here. So let me start with you, Dr. Malcolm. I, I just yes. want to make this clear for the record. You spent a decent yeah. amount of your written testimony in the last portion of your right. uh, verbal testimony talking about uh, a conversation about including individuals on the no-fly list on the list of those that would right. be prohibited to purchase guns. Let's just make it clear for the record that it, that is not in the president's executive order that is the subject of this hearing today, correct? The president said that he wanted to include people on the no-fly list in the background check so they would not be able to buy guns. Right, but he's asked Congress to make that change. He has not included that in, let's just make it clear. It was one of his proposals. But that's not in the executive actions announced. It was one of those he announced. That's okay, how I for, know about it. For, for, for the record, it was not in the set of executive then where did it come actions from? that he announced. He has requested that Congress make oh. uh, that change, uh, and the president has acknowledged that that is a subject that is within the jurisdiction of Congress, not within the jurisdiction of enforcement of ex existing law. So I think it's important to point out for the record that that is not part of the underlying executive actions. Um, second, I just want to make it clear, you, you said in your testimony, or maybe in answer to a question from Senator Shelby, that he announced that the penalty for violating the existing law 
uh, with respect to who needs to be licensed uh, is a certain I period of time not, in jail. I said announced. Uh, that That's he announced, the then I misspoke. The penalty is, is. listed as and, and, the, on the record that. The, the that's part the, of which you read. That's the existing law, correct? That is existing law. That's existing law. That's right. um, and, and I think this you know, speaks to part of our disagreement. Um, if, if the very notion of expressing what the penalty is for violating the law equals intimidation, um, then that is a very different reading uh, of our set of criminal uh, statutes than many of us have come to understand. Uh, so that's a simple recitation of the existing penalty. But it, when you imply that a whole lot of people who are no long, who are not at the moment under the law are going to be and will face that penalty, <coughs> then I think that it is important. Well, so then let's get to that implication. So uh, um, thank you very much, uh, Attorney General Strange, for being here today. You use strong words. Um, in referring to the president's executive order, I think you talked about this being an unwarranted assault on the Second <coughs> Amendment. Um, and I think this is where we get down to a question of the words on the page versus your perceived um, intention. Um, and maybe we can all concede that it's a little difficult for us to uh, understand uh, what sits in the thoughts and minds of the individuals who write laws and write guidance. And so we're left uh, first with the words on the page. So maybe just share with me um, which of these sort of five key points that are in this guidance um, do you perceive to be the unwarranted assault on the Second Amendment? or? Is that interpretation dependent on an interpretation of intentions that you've derived independent of what the Attorney General has testified to today? Well, I think I would adopt the comments of my colleague, Senator Cuccinelli, and I think Senator Shelby's already sort of gone into that, into that detail, and I'm happy to answer that question, but I'm really jumped at the opportunity to come at the Senator's invitation because I wanted to deliver the message from the men and women on the street the people who are actually going into the cat catastrophic active shooter situations and get their opinion and bring that here. And not only to criticize the president's proposal, because I don't think it's the right way to go about addressing these issues we all care about, but to point out that the areas that do make a difference and where the Senate committee here can make a difference have been neglected. And one example is the... Uh, but, but, but I guess my, my question, let me just, because I, I'm going to run out of time. I know I'm already over, but what, what specifically, what, what's the section here that you perceive to be, uh, be intimidating? What, what's the language here that's the assault on the Second Amendment, just to the extent that you can point me to the provision that you're referring to? Uh, I, if I could follow up with that, I'd be happy to, Senator. I don't have it in front of me, but I can tell you that the, the sentiment of the men and women in law enforcement, the people that I work with every day who are devoted to solving the problems that we all care about, preventing it. I, I appreciate that. I think, I, think you, I think you have an obligation to, to point to the specific provisions given that we're talking about it, but let me, I think, Mr. Cuccinelli, you might be jumping at that opportunity, so let me just turn it over to you. I get the sense that you probably have the most problem with the recitation of the existing court cases that, uh, um, that are currently the way in which you would interpret whether you are subject to the requirement or not. Um, and so you repeatedly referred to uh, this suggestion that if you sell only one firearm, that you may be required to uh, obtain a license. That's included in a section which simply recites existing court cases. Um, so l let me just ask you the simple question. Do you dispute any of the information that's listed in this section relative to the description of existing court cases on this question of who has to get a, who has to get a, a license? Yeah, my concern partly arises from uh, experience. I mean, in my four years as Attorney General of Virginia, um, I dealt with the business end of the spear of the federal government as they overread, if you will, overinterpreted and thereby used very aggressively authority they didn't have. And we beat them back occasionally, but we had to do it. And they're counting on the fact that that corporations uh, and individuals don't want to fight with the federal government. And when, with the intimidation you're asking the professor about is the rather vaguely worded, despite the Attorney General's continual use of the word clarify, it is exactly the opposite of what they are doing. 
They are opening the door to the application of five-year jail penalties to a bunch of people who right now, under the existing law, believe they understand that they don't fall under that umbrella. What's, what's, what's vague here? Point me to the, so what I see is a recitation of the existing law and then a recitation of existing court cases that are public records. So what of that is, is, is intentionally vague such as to be uh, intimidating? Senator, if all they wanted to do was actually apply the laws that exist today, they wouldn't have to say anything. They could just keep pressing ahead and make greater efforts, hopefully, to apply the existing laws. But what's, that is clearly but what's, vague, not, but what's vague here? What, what, when, when, when you bring all of it together, and, and you, you all, uh, or the Attorney General with one of you on the panel, uh, was discussing circuit-to-circuit circuit differences, for instance. Fourth Circuit, which I am in, um, we... We have, uh, we have some unique case law, but the people who live in the Fourth Circuit who do think of themselves as dealers and who do make a business of selling um, recognize what that law is. They have come to understand it. And so now you're introducing at the national level um, a, a new threat of enforcement that there wouldn't be any need for if the law wasn't going to change. So what are they to think? They are to think that something has now changed and, and the five-year penalty is being held out over their heads in a way that they now have to be concerned about. That intimidation has been used in all sorts of regulatory arenas by this administration uh, for seven years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you Mr. Mr. Chairman, yeah, just to, just to, uh, I know we're wrapping up, just a concluding thought. Listen, I, I think it, at, at the heart of this issue it, it is simply a disagreement about what the words on this page say. Um, and I think it's important that when pressed, none of our witnesses could actually recite any actual verbiage in the order which speaks to this claim of intimidation. And, and I think the exception that you talked about, Mr. Chairman, for those that are just engaging in personal sales from their collection is important, but that's in the, the guidance. I mean, the guidance says very specifically, if you only make occasional sales of firearms from your personal collection, you do not need to be licensed. You need to be licensed if you repetitively buy and sell firearms with the principal motive of making a profit. Um, I, I, I think there's just a fundamental disagreement uh, about what is actually on the page here. And I hope that as we have this debate, it's not anchored in perceived intentions of what the administration is quietly, secretly planning to do, but that the objections are based in the actual text of the executive order. And I think that's what we've been missing in this hearing so far. We've been missing uh, disputes and objections that are anchored in the actual text. If you come back to the text, it says exactly what we all agree on, which is that we should enforce the existing law, we should require people engaged in the business of selling firearms to get licensed wherever they do so, and that we should let out from under that rubric of regulation those that are just selling firearms occasionally from their personal collection.